Society by Theodore Adorno. The idea of society confirms Nietzsche's insight that concepts, which are basically shorthand for process, elude verbal definition. For society is essentially process. Its laws of movement tell more about it than whatever invariables might be deduced. Attempts to fix its limits ends up with the same result. If one, for instance, defines society simply as mankind, including all the subgroups into which it breaks down, out of which it is constructed, or if one, more simply still, calls it the totality of all human beings living in a given period, one misses thereby all the subtler implications of the concept. Such a formal definition presupposes that society is already a society of human beings. That society is itself already human, is immediately one with its subjects. As though, as though the specifically social did not consist precisely in the imbalance of institutions over men, the latter coming little by little to be the inca incapacitated products of the former. In bygone ages, when things were perhaps different, in the Stone Age, for instance, the word society would scarcely have had the same meaning as it does under advanced capitalism. Over a century ago, the legal historian J.C. Bluntschley characterized society as a concept of the third estate. It is that, and not only on account of the egalitarian tendencies which have forked their way down into it, distinguishing it from the feudal or absolutistic idea of fine or high society, but also because in its very structure, this idea follows the model of middle-class society. In particular, it is not a classificatory concept, not for the instance, the highest abstraction of sociology under which all lesser social forms would be ranged. In this type of thinking, one tends to confuse the current scientific ideal of a continuous and hierarchical ordering of categories with the very object of knowledge itself. The object meant by the concept society is not in itself rationally continuous, nor is it to its elements as a universal to particulars. It is not merely a dynamic category, it is a functional one as well. And to this first, still quite abstract, approximation, let us add a further qualification, namely the dependency of all individuals on the totality which they form. In such a totality, everyone is also dependent on everyone else. The whole survives only through the unity of the functions which its members fulfill. Each individual, without exception, must take some function of it on himself, in order to prolong his existence. Indeed, while his function lasts, he is taught to express his gratitude for it. It is on account of this functional structure that the notion of society cannot be grasped in any immediate fashion, nor is it susceptible of drastic verification, as are the laws of the natural sciences. Positivistic currents in sociology tend therefore to dismiss it as a mere philosophical survival. Yet such realism is itself unrealistic, for while the notion of society may not be deduced from any individual facts, nor on the other hand be apprehended as an individual fact itself, there is nonetheless no social fact which is not determined by society as a whole. Society appears as a whole behind each concrete social situation Conflicts such as the characteristic ones between manager and employees are not some ultimate reality that is wholly comprehensible without reference to anything outside itself. They are rather the symptoms of deeper antagonisms. Yet one cannot subsume individual conflicts under those larger phenomena as the specific to the general. First and foremost, such antagonisms serve as the laws according to which such conflicts are located in time and space. Thus, for example, the so-called wage satisfaction, which is so popular in current management sociology, is only apparently related to the conditions in a given factory and in a given branch of production. In reality, it depends on the whole price system as it is related to the specific branches, 
on the parallel forces which result in the price system in the first place, and which far exceed the struggles between the various groups of entrepreneurs and workers, inasmuch as the latter have already been built into the system and represent a voter potential that does not always correspond to their organizational affiliation. What is decisive in the case of wage satisfaction as well as in all others is the power, stru power structure, whether direct or indirect, the control by the entrepreneurs over the machinery of production without a concrete awareness of this fact. It is impossible adequately, it is impossible adequately to understand any given individual situation without assigning to the part what really belongs to the whole. Just as social mediation cannot exist without that which is mediated, without its elements, individual human beings, institutions, situations, in the same way the latter cannot exist without the former's mediation. When details come to seem the strongest reality of all, on account of their tangible immediacy, they belong the eye to genuine perception. Because society can neither be re neither be defined as a concept in the current logical sense, nor empirically demonstrated, while in the meantime social phenomena continue to call out for some kind of conceptualization, the proper organ of the latter is speculative theory. Only a thoroughgoing theory of society can tell us what society really is. Recently, it has been objected that it is unscientific to insist on concepts such as that of society, inasmuch as truth and falsehood are characteristics of sentences alone, and not of ideas as a whole. Such an objection confuses a self-validation concept, such as that of society, with a traditional kind of definition. The former must develop as it is being understood and cannot be fixed in arbitrary terminology to the benefit of some supposed mental tidiness. The requirement that society must be defined through theory, a requirement which is itself theory of society, must further address itself to the suspicion that such theory lags far behind the model of the natural sciences still tacitly assumed to be binding on it. In the natural sciences, theory represents a clear point of contact between well-defined concepts and repeatable experiments, a self-developing theory of society. However, need not concern itself with this intimidating model, given its en enigmatic claim to mediation. For the objection measures the concept of society against the criterion of immediacy and presence, and if society is mediation, then these criteria have no validity for it. The next step is the ideal of knowledge of things from the inside. It is claimed that the theory of society entrenches itself behind such subjectivity. This would only serve to hinder progress in the sciences, so this argument runs, and in the most flourishing ones has been long since eliminated. Yet we must point out that society is both known and not known from the inside. Inasmuch as society remains a product of human activity, its living subjects are still able to recognize themselves in it, as from across a great distance, in a manner radically different than is the case for the objects of chemistry and physics. It is a fact that in middle-class society, rational action is objectively just as comprehensible as it is motivated. This was the great lesson of the generation of Max Weber and Dilthey, yet their ideal of comprehension remained one-sided, insofar as it precluded everything in society that resisted, it, resisted identification by the observer. This was the sense of Durkheim's rule that one should treat social facts like objects, should first and foremost renounce any effort to understand them. He was firmly persuaded that society meets each individual primarily as that which is alien and threatening, as constraint. Insofar as that is true, genuine reflection on the nature of society would begin precisely where comprehension ceased. The scientific method which Durkheim stands for thus registers that Hegelian second nature which society comes to form against its living members. This antithesis to Max Weber remains just as partial as the latter's thesis, and that it cannot transcend the idea of society's basic incomprehensibility 
any more than Weber can transcend that of society's basic comprehensibility. Yet this resistance of society to rational comprehension should be understood first and foremost as the sign of relationships between men, which have grown increasingly independent of them, opaque, now standing off against human beings like some different substance. It ought to be the task of sociology today to comprehend the incomprehensible, the advance of human beings into the inhuman. Besides which, the anti-theoretical concepts of that older sociology which had, which had emerged from philosophy are themselves fragments of forgotten or repressed theory. The early 20th century German notion of comprehension is a mere secularization of the Hegelian absolute spirit, of the notion of a totality to be grasped. Only it limits itself to particular acts, to characteristic images, without any consideration of that totality of society from which the phenomenon, to be understood alone, derives its meaning. Enthusiasm for the incomprehensible, on the other hand, transforms chronic social antagonisms into um, questionis facti. The situation itself, unreconciled, is contemplated without theory, in a kind of mental asceticism, and what is accepted thus ultimately comes to be glorified, society as a, mechanism, as a mechanism of collective constraint. In the same way, with equally significant consequences, the dominant categories of contemporary sociology are also fragments of theoretical relationships, which it refuses to recognize as such on account of its positivistic leanings. The notion of a role has, for instance, frequently been offered in recent years as one of the keys to sociology and to the understanding of human action in general. This notion is derived from the pure being for others of individual men, from that which binds them together with one another in social constraint, unreconciled, each unidentical with himself. Human beings find their roles in that structural mechanism of society which trains them to pure self conservate laureate or conser conservate glory at the same time that it denies them conservation of their selves. The all-powerful principle of identity itself, the abstract interchangeability of social tasks, works towards the extinction of their personal identities. It is no accident that the notion of role, a notion which claims to be value-free, is derived from the theatre, where actors are not in fact the identities they play at being. This divergence is merely an expression of underlying social antagonisms. A genuine theory of society ought to be able to move from such immediate observation of phenomena towards an understanding of their deeper social causes. Why human beings today are still sworn to the playing of roles. The Marxist notion of character masks, which not only anticipates the later category, but deduces and founds it socially, was able to account for this implicitly. But if the science of society continues to operate with such concepts, at the same time drawing back in terror from that theory which puts them in perspective and gives them their ultimate meaning, then it merely ends up in the service of ideology. The concept of role, lifted without analysis from the social facade, helps perpetuate the monstrosity of role-playing itself. A notion of society which was not satisfied to remain at that level would be a critical one. It would go far beyond the trivial idea that everything is interrelated. The emptiness and abstractness of this idea is not so much the sign of feeble thinking as it is that of a shabby permanency in the constitution of society itself, that of the market system in modern day society. The first objective abstraction takes place not so much in scientific thought as in the universal development of the exchange system itself, which happens independently of the qualitative attitudes of producer and consumer, of the mode of production, even of need, which the social mechanism tends to satisfy as a kind of secondary byproduct. Profit comes first, a humanity fashioned in a vast network of consumers. The human beings who actually have the needs have been socially preformed beyond anything which one might na naively imagine. And this not only by the level of industrial development, 
but also by the economic relationships themselves into which they enter, even though this is far more difficult to observe empirically. Above and beyond all specific forms of social differentiation, the abstraction implicit in mar market system represents the domination of the general over the particular, of society over its captive membership. It is not at all socially neutral phenomenon, as the logistics of reduction of uniformity of work time might suggest. Behind the reduction of men to agents and bearers of exchange value lies the domination of men over men. This remains the basic fact in spite of the difficulties with which from time to time many of the categories of political science are confronted. The form of the total system requires everyone to respect the law of exchange if he does not wish to be destroyed irrespective of whether profit is his subjective motivation or not. The universal law of the market system is not in the least invalidated by the survival of retrograde areas and archaic social forms in various parts of the world. The older theory of imperialism already pointed out the functional relationship between the economies of the advanced capitalistic countries and those of the non-capitalistic areas, as they were then called. The two were not merely juxtaposed, each maintained the other in existence. When old-fashioned colonialism was eliminated, all that was transformed into political interests and relationships. In this context, rational, economic, and developmental aid is scarcely a luxury. Within the exchange society, the pre-capitalistic remnants and enclaves are by no means something alien, mere relics of the past. They are vital necessities for the market system. Irrational institutions are useful to the stubborn irrationality of a society which is rational in its means, but not in its ends. In institutions such as the family, which finds its origins in nature, and whose binary structure escapes regulation by the equivalency of exchange, owes its relative power of resistance to the fact that, without its help, as an irrational component, certain specific modes of existence, such as the small peasantry, would hardly be able to survive, being themselves impossible to rationalize without the collapse of the entire middle-class edifice. The process of increasing social re uh, rationalization of universal extension of the market system is not something that takes place beyond the specific social conflicts and antagonisms, or in spite of them. It works through those antagonisms themselves, the latter at the same time tearing society apart in the process. For in the institution of exchange there is created and reproduced that antagonism which could at any time bring organized society to ultimate catastrophe and destroy it. The whole business keeps creaking and groaning on at unspeakable human cost, only on account of the profit motive and the interiorization by individuals of the breach torn in society as a whole. Society remains class struggle today, just as in the period when that concept originated. The repression current in the Eastern countries shows that things are no different there either. Although the prediction of increasing pauperization of the proletariat has not proved true over a long period of time, the disappearance of classes as such is mere illusion, a pif phenomenon, it is quite possible that subjective class consciousness has weakened in the advanced countries. In America, it was never very strong in the first place. But social theory is not supposed to be predicated on subjective awareness. And as society increasingly controls the very forms of consciousness itself, this is more and more the case. Even the oft-touted equilibrium between habits of consumption and possibilities for education is a subjective phenomenon, part of the consciousness of the individual member of society, rather than an objective social fact. And even from a subjective viewpoint, the class relationship is not quite so easy to dismiss as the ruling ideology would have us believe. The most recent empirical sociological investigation has been able to distinguish essential differences in attitude between those assigned in a general statistical way to the upper and the lower classes. The lower classes have fewer illusions, are less idealistic. The happy few hold such materialism against them. 
As in the past, workers today still see society as something split into an upper and a lower. It is well known that the formal possibility of equal education does not correspond in the least to the actual proportion of working class children in the schools and universities. Screened from subjectivity, the difference between the classes grows objectively with the increasing concentration of capital. This plays a decisive part in the existence of individuals. If it were not so, the notion of class would merely be fetishi fetishization. Even though consumers' needs are growing more standardized, for the middle class, in contrast to the older feudality, has always been willing to moderate expenditures over intake, except in the first period of capitalist accumulation, the separation of social power from social helplessness has never been greater than it is now. Almost everyone knows from his own personal experience that his social existence can scarcely be said to have resulted from his own personal initiative. Rather, he has to search for gaps, openings, jobs from which to make a living, irrespective of what seems to him his own human possibilities or talents. Should he indeed still have any kind of vague inkling of the latter? The profoundly social Darwinistic notion of adaptation borrowed from biology and applied to the so-called sciences of man in a normative manner expresses this and is indeed its ideology. Not to speak of the degree to which the class situation has been transposed onto the relationship between nations, between the technically developed and underdeveloped countries. That even so society goes on as successfully as it does is to be attributed to its control over the relationship of basic social forces, which has long since been extended to all the countries of the globe. This control necessarily reinforces the total, 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 totalitarian tendencies of the social order and is a political equivalent for an adaptation to the total penetration by the market economy. With this control, however, the very danger increases, which such controls are designed to prevent, at least on this side of the Soviet and Chinese empires. It is not the fault of technical development or industrialization as such. The latter is only the image of human productivity itself, cybernetics and computers merely being an extension of the human senses. Technical advancement is therefore only a moment in the dialectic between the forces of production and the relationships of production, and not some third thing, demonically self-sufficient. In the established order, industrialization functions in a centralistic way. On its own, it could function differently. Where people think they are closest to things as with television delivered into their very living room, nearness is itself mediated through social distance through great concentration of power. Nothing offers a more striking symbol for the fact that people's lives, what they hold for the closest to them and the greatest reality, personal, maintained in being by them, actually receive their concrete content in large measure from above. Private life is, more than we can even imagine, mere reprivatization. The realities to which men hold have become unreal. Life itself is a lifeless thing. A rational and genuinely free society could do without administration as little as it could do without the division of labor itself. But all over the globe, administrations have tended under constraint towards a greater self-sufficiency and independence from their administered subjects, reducing the latter to objects of abstractly, norm, abstractly normed behavior. As Max Weber saw, such a tendency points back to the ultimate means ends uh, rationality of the economy itself, because the latter is indifferent to its end, namely, namely that of a rational society, and as long as it remains indifferent to such an end, for so long will it be irrational for its own subjects. The expert is the rational form that such a rationality takes. His rationality is founded on specialization in technical and other processes, but has its ideological side as well. The ever smaller units into which the word, the work process is divided begin to resemble each other again, once more losing their need for specialized qualifications. 
Inasmuch as these massive social forces and institutions were once human ones, are essentially the reified work of living human beings, this appearance of self-sufficiency and independence in them would seem to be something ideological, a socially necessary mirage, which one ought to be able to break through to change. Yet such pure appearance is the ens realissimum in the immediate life of men. The force of gravity of social relationships serves only to strengthen that appearance more and more. In sharp contrast to the period around 1848, when the class struggle revealed itself as a conflict between a group imminent to, to society, the middle class, and one which was half outside it, the proletariat, Spencer's notion of integration, the very ground law of increasing social rationalization itself, has begun to seize on the very minds of those who are to be integrated into society. Both automatically and deliberately, subjects are hindered from coming to consciousness of themselves as subjects. The supply of goods that floods across them has that result, as does the industry of culture and countless other direct and indirect mechanisms of intellectual control. The culture industry sprang from the profit-making tendency of capital. It developed under the law of the market, the obligation to adapt your consumers to your goods, and then by a dialectical reversal, ended up having the result of solidifying the existing forms of consciousness and the intellectual status quo. Society needs this tireless intellectual reduplication of everything that is, because without this praise of the monotonously alike and with waning efforts to justify that which exists on the grounds of its mere existence, men would ultimately do away with this state of things in impatience. Integration goes even further than this, that adaptation of men to social relationships and processes which constitutes history and without which it would have been difficult for the human race to survive has left its mark on them such that the very possibility of breaking free without terrible instinctual conflicts, even breaking free mentally, has come to seem a feeble and a distant one. Men have come to be triumph of integration, identified in their innermost behavior patterns with their fate in modern society, in a mockery of all the hopes of philosophy, subject and object have attained ultimate recon reconciliation. The process, of, the process is fed by the fact that men owe their life to what is being done to them. The effective rearrangement of industry, the mass appeal of sports, the fetishization of consumers' goods all, are all symptoms of this trend. The cement which once ideologies supplied is now furnished by these phenomena which hold the mass of social institutions together on the one hand, the psychological constitution of human beings on the other. If we were looking for an ideological justification of a situation in which men are little better than cogs to their own machines, we might claim without much exaggeration that present day human beings serve as such an ideology in their own existence, for they seek of their own free will to perpetuate what is obviously a perversion of real life. So we come full circle. Men must act in order to change the present petrified conditions of existence. But the latter have left their mark so deeply on people, have deprived them of so much of their life and individuation, that they scarcely seem capable of the spontaneity necessary to do so. From this, apologists for the existing order draw new power for their argument that humanity is not yet ripe, even to point even to point the vicious circle out breaks the taboo of the integral society. Just as it hardly tolerates anything radically different, so also it keeps an eye out to make sure that anything which is thought or said serves some specific change, or has, as they put it, something positive to offer. Thought is subjected to the subtlest censorship of the terminus ad quem. Whenever it appears critically, it has to indicate the positive steps desired. If such positive goals turn out to be inaccessible to present thinking, why then thought itself ought to come across resigned and tired, as though such obstruction were its own fault, and not the signature of the thing itself? That is the point at which society can be recognized as a universal block, both within men and outside them at the same time. 
Concrete and positive suggestions for change merely strengthen this hindrance, either as ways of administrating the unadministratable, or by calling down repression from the monstrous totality itself. The concept and the theory of society are legitimate only when they do not allow themselves to be attracted by either of these solutions. When they merely hold in negative fashion to the basic possibility inherent in them, that of expressing the fact that such possibility is threatened with suffocation. Such awareness without any preconceptions as to where it might lead would be the first condition for an ultimate break in society's omnipotence.